yes, uh, the, there's lots of uh, content in the world about CSS. And there's probably a little bit less than there ought to be on how to incorporate CSS into a our workflow. Uh -huh. you, did you run into the, the div tag joke, um, centering a div tag? That's usually a, a, a common CSS meme of, of just hire that person. If they can center a div tag uh, mm -hmm. on a web page, then, then hire them. They know what they're doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, I, 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 to, to be honest, I'm blissfully ignorant of being able to do that. So uh, don't hire me for that. <laughs> but I never claim to be a front end engineer. Um, don't right. stalk me for hiring me. <laughs> that that would be more uh, precise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, what have I got here? Um, if I uh, <laughs> hold on, I'll share the appropriate things and. Um, that that would be very interesting because I know very few about this HTML language, mm, uh, yeah, yeah. so that would be interesting to to be able yeah. to apply a few of these things. Yeah. Uh, so if I transfer that over to there, begin your respect to that comment. I <laughs> I I always laugh because everybody just takes uh, it takes it for face value that you know how HTML works. And when you, when you really start to read a lot of the books and they're, you know, 10 steps ahead of where you're, you're actually at. No, I, I agree with you hundred um, percent. HTML is such a, uh, what's the word? It starts with a P uh, not progressive. Um, it's such a wide accepted concept of, of how web development works. And then when you, when you really start to build apps with it and you realize I don't know as much as I should know uh, <laughs> with that respect, that's a, that's a good comment. Yeah. And it's such a large, large topic. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mets. the thing I found difficult with shiny is that um, with, with like CSS and stuff, hold on, my dog's crying at the door. Um, <laughs> with CSS, you, you, when you, when you start a shiny app, you automatically load up uh, Bootstrap into that app. And any tweaks that you make, if you add a custom CSS or something, you have to, you, my understanding is you have to be able to write it, but you also have to be quite fluent at Bootstrap so that you don't destroy what's already been formatted by you know shiny and bootstrap and things like that so in order to like um customize things you don't just need to know css and shiny and html you also need to know a lot of the um the the tools that have been interlaced between them and um uh, yeah i i don't know i mean the the what i find Curious is that just the number of different classes that Bootstrap adds to everything. And we, if I modify some of them, we, I, I'm probably going to cause all untold damage. Anyway, um, yes, so this is a gentle introduction to CSS. There is another introduction to CSS for Shiny as part of a separate book. Um, uh, which is a book that I, I'm quite keen to study at some point, but I, I haven't quite got round to doing it because because it's a little more advanced than uh, um, uh, it's it's more advanced as far as the front end components are um, f f with regard to Shiny than I'm comfortable with at the moment. Um, so. Uh, I'm, so I'm working through things like engineering Shiny. We've already done mastering Shiny. I'm planning to do this JavaScript for R book. Um, and I think, I, I don't know, I, the, 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 there was a kind of re a joke in, in maths about, you know, in order to read this book, you need to understand the prerequisites and the prerequisites of those prerequisites. And ultimately, you have to have read an infinite number of textbooks in order to read any textbook. And I don't want to get into that situation because there's probably stuff in this book, this, uh, I'll show you the front page, um, that would be useful to me right now. Um, 
so anyway, so, but the, the CSS chapter in, in this second book is considerably more advanced than the equivalent introductory chapter in the engineering shiny book. Um, be, you know, because that, you know, the, the, the other book, the, this one is building on a lot of front end tools and, 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 and whatnot in a way that the engineering shiny one probably, you know, isn't really, hence this being the final chapter. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll get into the content. Um, so this is, uh, the stuff that I pulled out from the chapter. So uh, the things that it aims to teach you is what the purpose of CSS is, um, some kind of background regarding how CSS is used by Shiny, even if you don't realize it's being used, and how to write custom CSS, and then how to integrate that with your Shiny app. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the first thing you, you'd need to know is precisely what CSS does. And, um, so CSS is the, um, cascading style sheets, um, which is like a declarative language, a kind of descriptive language for, um, how to format a, uh, typically a web page you know, the, the web is pervasive. So if you can format an HTML file, people will use your um, techniques to format, you know, different, you know, um, standalone apps and things like that. So CSS and HTML are actually used beyond the web. But um, yeah, uh, anyway, so this is a, it's, it's like a language that is used to encode what your website should look like. Um, and um, you can actually have a look at what a, a typical website might look like without CSS. Um, if you download this particular uh, uh, tool. So I'll, I'll show you the um, um, thing. So it's a uh, web developer here. Um, and, oh, do I have a good website open anywhere in there? Da, 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 I'm trying not that's, to... that's a plugin, correct, too? Are you using Mozilla? Is uh, that a plugin to your... This is using Chromium. Chrome, okay, Chromium um, plugin. Yeah, so if I, da, 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 not to give away one of the problems I was having with this chapter too, um, <laughs> too soon, but actually the, um, given that the book, you know, the, the, the notes for this um, uh, book club are an HTML document. If you, um, if you write a code chunk that outputs HTML, uh, you know, you've got an R, thing and you print out the user interface from a shiny app it will um markdown will assume that it's html that should be formatted appropriately and things like that and and, and i was at it. no i just want to see what the the plain text version of the html would look like anyway so this is um just a, a typical google search if i go into web developer here which is a plugin for chromium and um, so I've got sort of disabled JavaScript, disabled notifications, those kinds of things. Go into the CSS tab and disable all styles. Um, now it looks bizarre. Um, let's have a see what else is there. If I get the R for data science. Um, uh, R for data science. Oh, I don't actually know where it is. Right, uh, R for DS just have a look at, Let's just have a look at the Twitter okay. version and we'll um, drop the um, styles on here. And yeah, you get 
a lot of big images. And then if you scroll all the way down, sorry if anyone's epileptic or anything like that. Um, yeah, you can see here the text and stuff like that is formatted in a very kind of Spartan way. Um, anyway, so that's, um, yeah, so the, the sort of text, this is like a heading and a link and things like that. So they look, if you take away all the CSS, they look like websites looked when I first went to university in like 1996. Um, <laughs> so not great, but um, yeah, so CSS is, is a, a, a kind of, it, it's a standard tool that you need to have a kind of working knowledge of if you're doing like web development and stuff but because shiny is ultimately web development even if it's you know pitched towards creating uh data visualization data exploration type apps um ultimately it is web development and it is based on html and javascript and css uh in, in the front end um so anyway so you can see um the uh css um for ah yes so you can see how that's weird why has that happened um if i pull over our studio for a second so what happens if you look at css with and with oh i see what's happened sorry i was exploring things and then delete them afterwards right so i've got an example here of um some so if i just save that and it will update um so i've got an example that's come from the book so i've got a list of tags a kind of top level heading a, a subheading a paragraph and then a kind of selector that picks a um, species from the iris data set. Um, so that's a bare list of tags. Um, you can use that as your user interface in Shiny, but it's more typical in Shiny to wrap those kinds of tags in a fluid page, which um, alters the, um, you know, what the the page looks like if i pull out the um if i run various things two, four, five and then i run if i pull our studio across again so this is the first one this is without the fluid page wrapped around it user interface one okay and that looks like this. So you've got a kind of gray background. You have um, uh, some black text and a selector. If I then, um, I'll have to close that and then um, run the second version where this second version, the user interface is wrapped with a fluid page thing. The hard edges of the text in that previous one have been rounded off a little bit. The um, the backdrop is white rather than grey. The selector is a little bit uh, nicer as well. So just with that one bit of that one change to your user interface, you actually um have a, a, a kind of big effect on what the um app looks like maybe a subtle effect um so the user interface the only difference here if i print out the html we've got um a container fluid class wrapping the second one uh whereas the first one is just a series of tags in a kind of row but the um what i think is actually happening and i couldn't work out 
I, I'm fairly certain it's a problem I solved for the Master in Shiny book club last year, but I can't remember how I actually did it. But um, the I, I can't work out how to print to the screen the HTML header as well as the HTML body that is constructed by a Shiny app. Uh, that, that, that you use within a Shiny app. So this is all content that would be in the body of the HTML. Um, and for some reason, these apps aren't running very well in the browser for me at the moment. So if I look at Shiny App UI 1 and open that in the browser, it looks like this. But I think the formatting has changed a little bit. Um, anyway, so we've got various scripts that are pulled in, da, 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 bootstrap and stuff like that. Um, if I do, if I pull in the second one and transfer that over, again, you pull in the same, you know, bootstrap scripts and stuff like that. But because you've wrapped in container fluid, the CSS from Bootstrap has formatted that simple app. Um, anyway, I think it's something like that, but I might be wrong. Anyway, um, so that's um, the 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 basic CSS that you use when you open up when you when you write a shiny app that you don't encode any kind of um, personalized formatting for. Um, if I then look at, uh, oh, sorry. So now the, the second section of this chapter is talking about how to actually write CSS. Now, um, it's a very brief introduction. Um, and oh, I keep putting in these H links and they never quite work if I copy the text. Um, right, so this is the MDN um, kind of uh, tutorials, the, the sorry, Mozilla Developer Network tutorials on CSS, which are great. Um, there is a um tutorial about how to uh you know the various tutorials about how to write css how to incorporate it into a you know a a, a typical html you know a plain html website um and i mean simply because of how long the tutorial is compared with this uh, introductory chapter it covers a great deal more information than you could cover in this chapter um, but I'm, I, I'm passing it on as a link because I think it's a very good resource um, so HTML is packed full of tags you might have an h1 to indicate that it's a top level header you might have an h2 indicating that it's a subheader you might have a p tag to indicate a paragraph and an a tag to indicate a um, hyperlink to either another section in the document or to another website or something. Um, with CSS, you kind of explain how um, those the HTML elements that correspond to those tags, um, how they should look when the when your website is presented to the user. Um, so you're basically describing if an element has this tag, say H2, it should look like this. And then you specify that um, some property, be it the color, the text size, the position or something like that, has some value. So you have a, this is a, what they call a selector, a CSS selector. It's a way of identifying the HTML elements in a document to which a particular set of um, um, 
modifications should be applied to, then for each selector, you'd have um, a, um, a property and the value that it should take. So whenever there's an H2 document, it's the, the col text color should be red, okay? So the CSS looks like that. Um, but you don't only identify elements by the type of HTML element that they are. So it, you, you're not s restricted to just identifying things by whether they're, you know, lists or paragraphs or divs or something like that. You can also identify things by their identifier and by the class of the element. So if we look at a um, the, where was the HTML? Oh, sorry, it was in the previous page. So if we look in the HTML that printed out here, so we've got the various different HTML elements, div, h1, h2, p. Uh, for some of them, there's a class element, uh, a class, sorry, attribute. And, you know, for those class attributes, you have a particular value. Um, so we've got a container fluid class here, a form group. Well, these are two separate classes. So you're, any given element is allowed to have multiple classes in an HTML document. Um, so that's classes. Or IDs are more specific. Um, so here we have um, an ID attached to this HTML element. If there are two elements in the same document that have the same ID, then that is illegal HTML. The, um, any given element in an HTML document can or cannot have an ID. So it's not necessary that each element has an ID. But when an element does have one, it must be specific just to that element. So um, there can't be another element in this document with the ID of what dash label. Um, sorry. Uh, so when you're writing, go on, you can go out. Um, when you're writing CSS, you can um, you can pull out. Where did I put my? Um, uh, you can. Da, 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 this hash then the ID. That's um, if you know the ID of a specific element in your document that you want to format in a particular way, be it like the header or something like that, that's, um, you know, that, 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 that needs a, very, a custom style. You can identify it specifically using this hash and then the name of the ID. Um, similarly, for any class that you might want to format, uh, you can identify that class using this dot prefix and then the class name and give properties and values. But um you know uh what did we have it was the something uh what label had a class of control label so if i had a css uh for what label here and a class here for the control label uh, and they both set the color for that element which of the two would actually be valid, which which of the two would actually be applied when a user views that element. Um, and there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of kind of, uh, there are rules to this. Um, and there's kind of like, you know, if it's, uh, the ID has a greater kind of, um, uh, weight attributed to it than a class name. So if there's a, an ID specific color scheme 
and there's a class specific color scheme, then the ID would take precedent. Um, but also, I, I think I that's think the, right. Is that right? No, it is. It is correct. And the reason that that is more appropriate is because it's more specific than mm, what the class yeah, is yeah, providing. Yeah. So the, the, the comment of weight isn't so much a, it's it, everything in HTML or anything in CSS is very hierarchical based. So you've got your parent and then child and then child and child and child. Yeah. The importance or the weight that you were referring to is if it is available, it will use that value provided or property provided uh, uh, instead of its parent container because or parent attribute uh, because it is just more specific. Um, yeah. yeah, and that helps you uh, uh, write a lot of CSS attributes, keeping that concept in mind. So I can have a P class, and then inside of P class, I can have you know uh, an additional you know uh, I don't know like a, a figure caption or, or a, a P class figure, P class image, P class something. I'm going to take in the parent of that to paint on the screen or to render on the screen but then because it's got an id associated with it i'm being more specific so therefore the attribute takes over yeah yeah, yeah no um so there's uh, so the way that css applies to a web page is there's um you you have to consider the the specificity of the selectors that you use in your css document um so identifiers outweigh class names and class names outweigh um, uh, what do you call them the, the kind of divs and things like that but also if if there's you know multiple classes to which that, that apply to a particular element um, and there's no way to distinguish between them in terms of the specificity then ultimately the last one of them wins. There's a, there's a kind of positional hierarchy as well within CSS in addition to this kind of specificity. So that kind of stuff isn't covered in this book. Um, it kind of loosely introduces that you can uh, write a CSS file that looks vaguely like this and that specifies, you know, properties and values and, and whatnot for each selector that you might use. There are ways of combining selectors together as well. And that kind of the, those combinations of selectors can also be contribute to the specificity scores and things as well. Um, so this is like either an H1 or an H2. So if you had a, a, a CSS block where this was the selector, then whatever's within that block, whatever property and value are within that block will apply to both top level headings and to subheadings as well. Um, this is a kind of relative positioning of elements. So this is an eight, any H1 element that lies, that is a, um, um and and what they call an ancestor of a div element um this is an h1 element that lies immediately inside a div element these kind of so so you've got um the the type of selector that you use be it a class or an id or, or something it influences what styles are applied because you know you choose the most specific one from the CSS file. The position in the CSS file influences what will be applied because if there's a more, if there's comparably specific CSS blocks that could apply to an HTML element, the last one will win. And also, you know, there are, um, um, the, 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 there's kind of dynamic properties as well. So the, in you know in a shiny app you might update the user interface um okay. such that i don't know whether that's that's probably not a good example but 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 certainly there's dynamic things in terms of you know when the user's hovering over something like a a, a hyperlink um css styles may apply in that um setting <clears throat> 
that it, if you want to learn CSS, this is not the chapter to learn it from, but there are very good resources out in the world. And, you know, the, the author does provide good links to, 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 to interesting resources. Um, the more important thing from a shiny perspective is how you actually use CSS in your app. So there's three different ways, three main ways of using um, CSS in a shiny app. And um, these correspond to the three main ways that you would incorporate CSS into a website. So um, there are, hold on, what are the three different, where are we? Where have I got, uh, um, oh, I thought there might be contents in this page. Um, so there should be, you can either have inline uh, styling. So this is kind of plain HTML here. With uh, Within this H1 element, they've applied a specific style to that, to that H1 element. So this is giving it blue text and a background of yellow and a kind of solid border. This is applying a red text color to this particular the text for this paragraph that's inline styles now inline styles have kind of frowned upon um they uh, you know a, a, a big a, a kind of key point of this book that we've been studying is um about um how to build shiny apps that are maintainable that are where the workload can be distributed across a team and things like that the problem with inline styling is that if you if you know if you're coloring the text blue for this particular heading your website will grow hopefully and as it grows you might add more content to it and then realize oh I'll need to change the color of the text in these subheadings as well to match the color here and things like that and Ultimately, you'll end up where you, if, if you do it on a kind of line by line basis or on an element by element basis using these inline styles, if, you're, if you've got an H1 here, an H2 down the bottom that you want to color blue as well, you've got multiple positions within that document where you'll need to modify if you ever want to change the color that the text is presented. And that kind of... Um, coupling is really, really um, uh, counterproductive. A better solution is to set up a kind of, a, a, you know, a CSS blocks that, you know, if, as in the, the, the example I was trying to give, if you have H1 elements and H2 elements that you want to, where the, where the text you want to color blue throughout your document it's better to have a css document that put that selects h1 and h2 elements and sets the colors to blue so that you write a single block that defines the color scheme for those things and it applies to every h1 and h2 in that thing so that you know if you come if you change your mind you change the design you've got a single place to modify rather than 5, 10, 15, 20, possibly 100 different places. Um, so that's inline styles. But the, pro the, the great thing about inline styles is that um, they're embedded in the app itself. If you're writing Shiny and you're, um, you just want to check what in what effect some styling will have on a particular element in your app just as a kind of throwaway experiment it's perfectly legitimate to put in inline stylings um to just to check things out and then once you've done that pull the style out into a custom css or something like that um, another great thing is you don't need to pass around css files and uh, you know along with your shiny app you don't have to ensure that they're 
deployed on the same server. So, you know, if your HTML is a, has been generated from an R Markdown document, say, um, and you're sending that, you've sent that HTML to a collaborator to have a look at, you know, to, to, you know, have a look at the figures and the, the, the report and whatnot, they need your CSS file in the same directory that they look at that HTML document. Because otherwise, all the styling that you spent so long working on is no longer, um, it, it isn't going to be, um, it, it's not going to be applied to the document where they view it. So a great thing about inline styles and in document styles, which we're we'll talking about next, is that they're embedded in with the app or in with the document. Now, yes, it, it, it isn't, I mean, as far as like shiny apps and stuff like that, it isn't great to do, to, to, to get into the habit of writing inline styling because there's loads of places to modify and things like that. But you've got to balance that against potential, uh, you know, other concerns. But I, I do think that probably inline styles is probably not the way to go. Um, but you can uh, do something that's kind of halfway between having a external file that you incorporate into your app and specifying, you know, a halfway house between having an external file that applies to your app and specifying on an element by element basis what the style should be. And that's to incorporate the, um, the CSS file as part of your, of, of the user interface um, that you specify for your Shiny app. So for example, you can use this tags dollar style uh, thing from, you know, tags is exported by Shiny. Um, and what this is doing is it's defining a CSS document that will apply to the Shiny app. Um, all of the styling is incorporated there. You're not doing any inline styling or anything like that. And what the HTML looks like after you've done that is it basically incorporates in a kind of style block like this what your CSS should look like. Now that's that's perfectly fine if you've only got a few tweaks that you want to do because um, this will be, you know, this, this will be transferred to each of your users' computers when they boot up your app. And, you know, if your style sheets are pretty large or if they basically just copy content from, you know, a bootstrap or a similar kind of um, thing, it may be better to have as a separate file that that can be referenced by your your app than than in a um, inside the either in the header or in the the body of your HTML uh, of the HTML that results from your app. Um, so that might. You, oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, of course. I was going to add real quick. So the styling, the uh, sorry, tag style. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is an in-document reference. So if I'm 99.9% .9 sure, all of your document referencing will go in the head uh, portion of your HTML page. So the, the, the way you want to think of it, so your inline style, the example you had previously is, is literally by line. Uh, your in-document styling would be contained within the head so that mm. as the document object model renders or compiles your, your HTML page, it's looking at the top and applying those attributes yeah, uh, yeah. in runtime. Yeah, yeah. Um, now the, uh, the final one I've not included in the, um, the, the, the code yet is to, in, is to completely separate your a, a .css file from the HTML uh, the, from, from your Shiny app. 
so this is uh the 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 kind of uh, sorry i'm just waiting for something to disappear um so that the the thing i've just discussed there was equivalent to having an internal style sheet like this and this is the start the the way of incorporating that that, that ryan's just dis described um so here's a relatively simple um body of a of a web page with um and the the styling for that web page encoded in a style block here and this is precisely what is generated this uh you know this bit here is precisely what's generated when you use tags dollar style in your user interface in 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 shiny um the third uh, way of incorporating CSS into a Shiny app is kind of equivalent to having an external style sheet where, uh, let's have a see, this is included like this. So you have a link. So this is, again, this is a, a, a kind of vanilla web page HTML thing. In the head for that page, you have a link to a CSS file, which presumably is in the, in a, in the same directory on a server somewhere. Um, this just tells it that it's a start. This just tells whoever's browser is reading this that it's a style sheet, and this tells it where to find the CSS file on the server that 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 this HTML came from. Um, and again, yeah. So CSS looks like. It, it it did uh, earlier on in the the thing you might um so i'll show you so that's that's incorporating it into a, a typical website um you use something called tags dollar link and what that will generate is this um link element within the html for your shiny app um this tells it yeah sorry what do you have to do so within tags dollar link if you look at um uh, ba, 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 ba. yeah so if i pull this over and we use tags dollar link it um all it does is sort of tell you it is generate an HTML element that that has a link um, it has the name link um, but you can add in various other attributes so that um, the you know what type of content is stored in there what um, the how it's formatted and where to find it um now <laughs> the um and and that's all fine <laughs> yeah so this is where you'd find this is where you'd find the file in the the server where your shiny app is being presented to the user from um it there there are countless different ways of in of adding a css file to a shiny app though when you're actually writing the you know when you're actually writing the source code um so the the um the golem way to do this hold on if we uh um now how do you how was it again if oh it's chapter eight isn't it chapter eight uh setting up for success right at the end of here um so here they talk about um how you build your first golem app how you build a prototype using golem and things like that so first you want to look at this is 
um, to create a new app using Gollum, you'd have um, you'd be in your R session type Gollum, create Gollum, and then the path to the um, to to where you want to store that um, app. It would create this, you know, package structure within your thing. Here, this www subdirectory of the whole thing is where you would store your CSS files if you were using Gollum. If you were using um, um, if you were using the the stru the app structure that's described in Master in Shiny, where it where your apps are extremely close to being package structured, but aren't officially R packages, um, so you'd have. Hold on, let's have the C. Where is it? Should I put it under the hood? Um, I don't have a good example of a, an app to show you, but it, the, in, um, yeah, so the, the structure looks similar to this, where you have an R directory with all the functions and modules and things like that that you might write. But in addition to that, you have a, app.r or you have a global ui and server.r files in the top level directory structure um, and with that you have a, a this www directory is at the top level of a more traditional shiny app structure um, and there's i don't know i mean there's You need, if you want to deploy to like shinyapps.io, it's better to have your app structured similarly to how it's described in Master in Shiny. Um, uh, let's have a see, is there a description of the app directory? No, it doesn't show it. Um, anyway. Um, yes, so uh, what was I going to show you? CSS. To add CSS files to a Gollum app, you just use Gollum, bang, bang, add CSS file. So let's create a Gollum app right now using precisely the same thing and check, the, check what it does. This is where I find out that I don't even have Gollum installed on the computer. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't think I've been <laughs> studying a book all about Gollum for like four months. <laughs> I always uh, find myself getting caught in those environmental <laughs> conditions. Like I, I, if you move machines, just here is the packages I call on most, just install all of them at that, yeah. at that time. All right. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to make a, I'll do it in, um, oh, I can probably do it. What, what's the directory structure for this? Is there a examples or something like that? Okay, so that will open up a new um, structure. So this is, you know, this is an R package. So it's got all the source code in R, My, you know, the documents and the kind of installable content here. This is the, the um, hold on if I run. Um, so you have, da, da, da. this is the World Wide Web directory within your, your Gollum app. 
um, and then if I add a custom CSS file to this, let's just call it custom like they have. Um, then where is that? It would be in inst app www.custom.css. That's fine. How do we actually incorporate it? Um, so here, Gollum add external resources. Um, what does that actually do? I think, oh, hold on. Um, I think that is a, it's quite a neat way of ensuring that anything in this um, app directory here is made available upon deployment and, and things, and, and also such that it's visible during development as well, because um, when you install, when you install a package, the directory structure changes slightly. So things that are in inst, or each of the subdirectories of inst gets pulled up to the top directory of your installed version of, of a package, which means that this app directory here moves up to here um, when it's installed on someone's computer. But while you're developing on it, um, the file paths are within that inst directory so there's um what am i doing Golem custom and i wanted to find out what that thing does add external resources is it right i spelled something wrong or maybe it's not yeah maybe it's internal and not documented That's strange. That's weird. Um, let's run the whole thing. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, this, um, ah, there we are, we found it. It's in app UI. Oh, it was, Right, I see. Sorry, <laughs> it was like 10 lines below where I was looking. Um, so what this is doing is um, it's ensuring that anything in app slash www is made available when you um, construct the the UI for your app. So if we now use, um, we can, if I source this file and then do, oh, I shouldn't have sourced it, should I? Sorry. Um, um, I should have loaded the whole thing package load put on. then um, then ram app UI and that's strange I thought the um, I thought the, the the CSS files would have been if we okay so Rather than doing that, let's do let's say run app. Oh, it's using shiny now. Oh, it's run sub app. Right, so this is a kind of the background app that it, you know, the, the, the kind of default app that you get out of the box if you make a fresh Gollum app. Um, if we then inspect the contents of it um, in the head, we have, oh, I think this might be the style sheet, which isn't quite what I was hoping for. I thought it was going to 
come up with something a little bit more um, um, interpretable. But that's like the uh, no, not that one. So text CSS style sheet. This is the um, the the the. Well, unless I've made a mistake, this a custom mm. CSS file. You might be able to do a control F and just look for the word custom. Okay. It is going to be under one of those styles somewhere. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe that's a bad idea. Maybe it's maybe it got incorporated as. Uh, where am I looking? Custom. There, link href www.custom.css. So when this is actually um, in a kind of, you know, when it, when it's actually viewed by someone's browser, the the um, the files, the custom.css is in the same kind of relative position to your 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 running app as would be a kind of traditionally structured shiny app it's just um when so it, it's equivalent to having um the inst app this directory at the top level here and that's what you would typically where you would typically put um the 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 static files for a a shiny app is in a dub 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 directory in this top level of um an app so yeah so i, I was quite interested in i mean i know that it, like <laughs> file paths and stuff like that aren't the most riveting thing but i was quite interested to see how it um how it organized the CSS and JavaScript files such that they were automatically made available on, um, you know, because the, the, there are three different settings. So it's if someone wants to run your app locally, but they're not a developer, they'll install your package and then call Ryan's package, bam, bang, run app on it if, if it's made with a golem. The CSS files and JavaScript files have to be organized in such a way that they're made available to that user in the same way that they're available to the developer working on that package in the same way that they're available when deployed onto shiny server or shiny apps.io or something like that. And the, those different settings kind of have different um requirements in terms of how the css and javascript files are positioned um so it's quite i don't know i found that quite interesting um but yes anyway sorry i've talked for ages and i didn't mean to talk for ages i'm planned on doing a kind of summary of the whole book um but if you'll uh, indulge me for another five minutes so that's um add in CSS files as external files. You can do precisely the same thing in incorporating external files into other um, HTML endpoints that you construct with R. So things like markdown, R markdown documents, um, bookdown, which is effectively R markdown. Um, you can incorporate custom CSS files in the same way. And, and the CSS syntax is exactly the same um but you might you know have to specify where the css file is found in a, a slightly different way in shiny compared with our markdown um yes so right where did we go from in this book we started off and the first few chapters were about um um how um about they were they were taking a kind of professional developer's mindset to constructing shiny apps what processes and um what structures you might need in place surrounding your app and the team working on it such that it would be um 
kind of successful, maintainable over time, used by multiple people and things like that. Um, Gollum was introduced as a tool uh, for imposing a, a kind of deliberate structure upon an app uh, such that, you know, you, you would define modules a particular way, you would structure your file paths a particular way, you would position, um, you would um you know anyway uh, so it, a way of imposing a kind of predictability on one app such that if you work on one and then you work on another that has been constructed the same way it should be fairly standardized and you'll know where to look to find the appropriate code and things like that um Gollum wasn't a huge part of this book and i found that quite surprising really considering the you know how successful it's been as a kind of tool for making shiny apps um it, it's mentioned in in it, you know in various places but a lot of the content in this book i found to be applicable uh regardless of how you were constructing your shiny app be it using the the workflow described in mastering shiny uh or you know, a lot of it, I mean, a lot of it in terms of, you know, um, prototyping, testing, uh, understanding deployment concerns, re uh, not reproducibility, but like um, uh, kind of re environment, you know, developer to developer reproducible builds of, a, of an app. A lot of those things transcended R itself would be applicable in a JavaScript project, would be applicable in a Python project. Um, and and also, I don't know, I mean, the some of the things, you know, I mean, version control, obviously, but um, um, there were, there was a lot of, there, there was a lot of useful tidbits of knowledge that went beyond simply how you make sure your shiny app is going to stay running for the next 6 12 18 months and um yeah i thought i thought the book was good on that on that front and and certainly so we went from planning your projects uh you, you know ensuring you've got appropriate tooling in place to build a, uh, a, a your your shiny app in a kind of sensible way stuff about designing getting um feedback on the user interface separately from the way that you build the kind of um you know the logical connections between things within an app the the you know the the computational steps working on the two sides of of, of an app separately and and there was a, a neat little um, uh, approach described whereby you set up your user interface um, with just with like kind of uh, you know uh, kind of template figures in place and and stuff so that. Um, your clients or your non-programming colleagues can see what the app will look like and um, be aware while they're looking at that design prototype that it isn't the final app that you know because you're looking at something that says ipsum lorem or whatever it is and it's got you know figures but they're iris or empty cars or something like that in the um it's quite apparent that this is a a, a mock-up of what the app will look like and also the the thing of having a r markdown um prototype of the back end of an app seemed quite quite uh an, a neat approach to to building out shiny apps um 
what else was there? Uh, yes, yeah, so there were, uh, I mean, but those were things that were kind of Gollum independent. So that was about how to prototype an app and, and how to kind of design and things. Um, strengthening, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I could probably bore everyone's uh, teeth out talking about testing. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, uh, so um, so it was interesting that there were there were a few tools introduced in the the you know the testing chapter and the uh, that that I wasn't actually aware of at the time, um, and now I'm using on a kind of weekly basis. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, the, but again, things like um, Puppeteer and and the 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 other the the Chrome interface thing built in R that that he'd written were useful tools that I can I can see being valuable in in you know coming years for me uh certainly more so than maybe shiny test and and that but um yeah uh and then it was quite interesting stuff in the optimization thing a little bit of an introduction to javascript and css which is kind of kind of useful because really it it, it you can do a lot in shiny and not know any javascript or css and um certainly javascript if you know a little bit of javascript it's it's quite a useful tool to have in your tool belt um you know if you need to pull values from shiny into the ui of your app or something like that if you just need to tweak a color scheme it's useful to be able to to know how to do that in css but i don't think these are critical skills to build in a, a, a long-standing, robust, shiny app. But I think it's good that they covered how to integrate those tools with a shiny app, particularly one that, you know, build with Gollum. And the optimization stuff was quite cool, but that uh, possibly a bit beyond me, to be honest. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what what do you think? We, uh, I'm I'm glad we did the book because, to be honest, when I when it was first proposed, um, I wasn't overly keen to do this one first. Um, and there was a lot of interest in in doing this book, so I said, oh, "We were, well, we'll do that one since there's been so much interest in that no one." who um, wanted to study this book has turned up to any one of the book clubs. I mean, they might watch on YouTube or whatever. And, uh, and I certainly hope, because apparently quite a few people watch on YouTube per week, and that's quite nice. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been quite a good book, though. I think it's it's been quite um, diverse, the, the stuff that's covered, and it's stuff that I haven't seen covered in a book on um shiny or our development really um anyway there's a uh i think i made a reference to last week or the uh, i guess two weeks ago three weeks ago i made a reference there's another book in relation to mastering shiny and this epgs book hmm. that is also dedicated to shiny production but um i'll find the link and forward it again uh in slack but the uh if, if we look at Mastering Shiny as being a foundation of <clears throat> how Shiny works or, or how do you build, you know, interaction to your, your our environment, you know, for, for uh, others to consume. Okay, now that you've got that, how do we expand on that? How do you go further? How do you uh, um, extend your reach of, of usability or, or uh, production grade, I guess? And that's where EPGS comes in. Yeah. This has been a, a really rewarding book club. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Good. I'm glad. Um. I, yeah, um, but, um, I, I like it as well. Uh, there were a few chapters that have been very interesting, and others a bit more compl complicated to me because I um, uh, do not have much experience on like uh, the, the last chapters. Um, uh, but uh, I found those things interesting because. Um, that there is somehow a way to apply these things uh, as when you need it yeah. and find a way, have the resources to work 
work it out and then find the way to apply the, the thing in your work. Like when you're building a shiny app and you need to add some extra features or opt optimize the, the work of the app. Yeah. Hmm. Brilliant. Well, yes, it's been great working through it with you both. Um, I'm sh I hear you You are both much more enthusiastic book club uh, attendees than me. Um, I hear you're <laughs> both doing like multiple book clubs all at the same time. I don't know how you manage it, to be honest. I can barely find time to write, or, or you know, I barely find time to attend some of these. But um, uh, certainly in terms of on the weeks when you have to kind of put some slides together, I find it very hard to find time. Um, brilliant. Um, you're doing um, ggplot is it or mastering Sh mastering shiny recently finished but you're doing ggplot as well aren't you i did i uh, i definitely definitely uh rely on federica uh, quite often in the ggplot world um very much more fluent uh than i am in that subject for sure <laughs> yeah at the moment i focus on on visualization yeah i really uh, spend a lot of time on that. I like it. And I think it's the best way. If you're able to do that fluently, it's, it's a very good way to to show your result properly and like in a, an attractive way. So that, that's it. I follow lots of, of the, these mm. book clubs because uh, it's a good practice to me. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they're very interesting. So I'm truly, fully, gratefully, great. I don't know how, to, how can I say that I'm, I'm absolutely grateful for this community. <laughs> uh, <that> is, <laughs> so, and uh, nice to, to have met you. Yeah, and you. you know, yeah. Uh, it's a good practice to, to, <laughs> to meet people and talk and uh, share some um, common interests. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Right. Well, I'm going to have to head off. Uh, have a right. lovely um, rest <laughs> of the year. I, I, I Hopefully I'll run JavaScript with R. Probably in a month or two's time, it might start. Do you, you think it'll be the same time block, Russ? Uh, but it'll, it'll be the same time of the day. It okay. might be a different day. Uh, certainly, as far as I'm, my my planning at least. Uh, work, unless someone yeah. else wants to organise it, and then they can run it whenever they want. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, that's that's my plan at least. But it won't be for another month at least because I'm quite looking forward to having a couple of weeks off. Really. Um, anyway, I look forward. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Good. Well, I look forward to seeing you around on Alpha Data Science. Good. Slack and things. Cool. Right. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.